And we're back with part two of MTV Arts and Alcove Dinner Theater's very first ever podcast. Uh, last week we talked about the origins and evolution of the Alcove Dinner Theater and some other little stories. And today we're going to pick right back up where we left off and it's going to be starting to talk about uh, MTV Arts and how that came about. Here we go. So let's get to where MTV Arts comes Yeah, in. so MTV Arts uh, was 2000, well, the you came up with a crazy idea in, I guess, 2006. Well, that was Janice. To do Janice Stone, Peter Pan. Producer, right. But you wanted to fly. I wanted to do Right it. off the bat. I saw it on Broadway. I thought, we can do that. Let's bring this to Mount Vernon. <laughs> and they, the, the other people said, no, you got to walk first before you can fly. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so we had a big meeting, um, and uh, some of that took place in my family room with Barbara Berry from First Knox National Bank, and she was one of our first biggest supporters. And uh, she came on board to give us some support, along with uh, Gordy Yance and um, the president of the bank at the time, and then uh, Sam Baroni with Community Trust. And uh, Sam's a, a, a dear friend of mine. I've known him for years. And uh, we sat down, and I wanted to do Peter Pan, but he thought it would be more logical to do a big musical first without all the technical end of it. So we did Beauty and the Beast. I feel like we still so, had some technical things for that. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But we weren't flying. We weren't flying. That's a whole different thing. We just had a, a thing that had to lift a human being up and transform and him. Transform him. So it's kind of like flying. Yeah. Um, um, and so, yeah, that came, and even then, that was the the not even the birth of MTV Arts. That was still under Bruce Jacklin and company. Right. You couldn't find a name, but we knew yeah. we wanted to do a musical. And uh, because there was a, usually there was another musical in August, so we did it early in June. So our community had more things. One weekend, do. too. It was, uh, was it Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday, or yeah, Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, four shows. Yeah. And we packed it. We packed it. And, yep. uh, it First show my grandmother ever came to twice. Yeah. First <laughs> we show. Got, uh, yeah, we sold out, and we even had to turn people away. On yeah. Sunday matinee, um, but that was very, uh, very encouraging. Uh, the downside was uh, towards the end of the year, my uh, tax accountant had called me and said, "Do you realize you have all this money sitting there? You're going to be taxed on it." We had sixteen thousand dollars, and we only charged six dollars a ticket. Yeah, it was so really. Yeah. We made quite a bit of uh, cash off that with attendance, and so Janice and I put our heads together. So uh, what she decided to do at that point was to spend the money for next year's production before the end of the year. Year, so it was already gone. So it, w it wasn't taxable, and I wasn't getting hit hard. With mm -hmm. it. So um, we ended up buying the rights to Peter Pan, the flying uh, apparatus, and the team to come in for that, the backdrops we needed. So we pretty much went through that uh, 16,000, I believe it was. Uh, and then we had the same problem the next year after Peter Pan, and we I think we even made more money. Uh, so we bought all the rights and everything we needed for Wizard of Oz, including the flying again, because we, we flew the the witches and Wizard of Oz. Um, so then by that point, um, gears were turning and Janice was able to get us a 5013C, I believe. Uh, it was a nonprofit, nonprofit status for, and she came up with the name and it was Janice's, uh, she came up with this, uh, MTV Arts. Mm -hmm. And she wanted it to be a housing thing for a lot of the arts. And uh, we were just a component in it, but it kind of took a life on its own. Now we're getting back to a little bit of that with the warehouse because we have Joe Bell housing the um, the, uh, the uh, Mount Vernon uh, Arts Festival mm -hmm. here, yep. and we've got the uh, the uh, Knox County Knox Jazz. County Jazz. They come in on Sundays and they rehearse in this building and they they use it and they use a little bit of our storage. So we're, we're becoming that community arts. Um, they yeah. Originally we started. Yeah, and I and I've talked with Janice about this and I've said you know I kind of made like a little anagram thing with it to say that we, because we always talk about how we're multitasking volunteers, because everyone goes, oh, it's MTV Arts, it's Mount Vernon Arts, or whatever. It's like, no, no. we kind of have, it's, it's very distinct, we kind of just do whatever it's, we do whatever we want with it. And we, she came up with the multitasking volunteers. Right. And then I said, well, with arts, you have appreciation, respect, and trust equals success. Right. And she was like, whoa, that's really good. I'm like, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just thought of it, thought it sounded really good, and it does, but that's kind of our motto really, is we have all these people working so hard to create all of these things. We all I, respect I each other, trust each other. I, I would not use the word working hard. I would use the word passionate. Passionate, yes. Seriously, because you walk in and people are dedicated. They, they're they proud of what they can do. Yeah. They love the collaboration. Uh, last year when we were building 
the um, the Wizard of Oz costumes and the Tin Man was piece by piece as it came together. I mean, the initial thing, everybody went, what? You know? Yep. And Susan wasn't finished with it. So as the collaboration came together, it just looked like a mix between the traditional Tin Man, but it was more of a mechanical look. Yeah. And I, it turned out to be one of my favorite costumes and that she's created. Um, so, you know, the passion. I think yeah. all these, the Ruth, when she comes up with uh, wonderful hairstyles and authentic or uh, fantasy, I mean, you could tell her heart. To yeah. It, you know? And I mean, it, and the thing is, we've, we've had that even from the very beginning. I mean, think about all the stuff we were doing because it was so bare bones. It was just so, you know, it was almost like put up a barn and put on a show. It was like Mickey Rooney almost, yeah. only with a really big budget. Yeah. So, I mean, we were building sets in your backyard on your deck. We were building sets out by Aerial Foundation Park. We were, you know, just doing all this stuff to make, make art, happen. make art, make it happen, yeah. make, make, yeah. imagining more together, which is another one of the slogans, yeah. and just making theater and making art, which is just amazing of how rough it was yeah. back then. Yeah. Well, uh, even not having this warehouse for being, the for Being young long. and dumb, there's something to be said yeah. about that. Uh, just driven by passion. Yeah. Uh, We're in our teens now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, and Joe Bell has just, you know, with his set building and ability, he and I get together, and I, I'll give him the vision of what I see as a director for the set. Any advancements in how he builds sets oh, yeah. to make it lighter and more oh, portable. The, draw, the, the uh, flats and yeah. things are just so... And, of course, he's a, a mechanical genius when it comes to things. We've got the air caster lifters where huge, massive set pieces can be just pushed around by elementary kids yeah. they're on stage crew. You know, it's, it's done. And think about how far even the warehouse has come. Yeah. Our warehouse was just this tiny little room, like it was just Part this school, area. Yeah. And then we kind of, I kind of, slowly yeah. moved things out creeped of the in. way and creeped, creeped into in. other people's areas and yeah. then pushed their stuff to another area. And now it's the, the whole building oh, is ours. Ramser's building. And yeah. he's, he's always been such a strong supporter and very generous with not just with us, but with the whole community, you know, and we, we owe a lot to Karen Wright and Aerial Foundation. Yes. And, and First Knox Park and, and, First Knox and the Community Foundation. They've yeah. all, it's it's amazing it's how many, and well. even in this town, yeah. how big the arts is. We it's have the, Meyer, yeah. just everybody. We have the Mount Vernon Music Arts Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, we have all these different theater companies. There's a, almost a dozen theater companies just in this town of, what, 18, 20,000 now yeah. around there. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that it's all for the arts and I mean you've got the gun gallery you've got uh, the gallery down here on the, the, on the square right. so you have all these different or downtown not the square but you have all these places where some form of the arts whether it's painting whether it's music whether it's we dance Coleman's with it's just glass blowing yeah downtown. it's just all here and that's mm -hmm. amazing and it's it almost feels like we were kind of a part of that mm -hmm. growth like we were here to say it's okay to kind of come out and do this stuff right. and bring it all together because yeah. a lot of places seemed like it was very not territorial because if you go to Columbus it's connected. It's yeah, connected. yeah yeah it's it's that you kind of want to bring everyone in and go hey this is we're all in this together to bring arts to right. the to the to the people well you know the, the, the sign of your art culture is the, the is is an indication of your your level of humanity yeah you 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 need them you need the arts it tells us who we are and so okay so for MTV arts we started with this musical you were like let's do a show <laughs> yeah. And then a couple years later, we now have a classic series. Right. From that almost, it's only a year later, really, 2007. We did What's Mice and Men in 2008. Right. And and that was born out of a necessity to do drama and to bring drama. Now, uh, we have never started a program unless we identify the audience first. You've got to identify an audience because it's like if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Mm -hmm. If you decide, let's put on a show, but nobody comes to see it, did you really put on a show? So you got to know who your who your audience, you know, who who are you doing this for? And once we put the identification on that. So with the classic series, a good friend of mine, dear dear friend uh, Matt Starr, uh, we did a lot of shows together. And of course our physicalities are so different. He's tall and bigger guy. I'm a shorter, uh, 
not smaller, build guy. And uh, so we did a lot of, um, we did Greater Tuna, we did Donkey Baseball, all these fun ad, uh, shows, these, these comedies and whatever that, that played off our sizes. But we wanted to do Mice and Men. But I said, you can't do it for dinner theater. Nobody's going to pay uh, to and have a primer of dinner and watch me shoot you in the back of the head at the end. That's no, well, you wanted to play. Alert. You wanted to play uh, Lenny first, <laughs> yeah, and then they were like, "No, yeah. they, you should. Yeah. <laughs> we're not. We're not going to reverse this." Yeah. But the, um, so, so anyway, uh, we decided no, that's not the right vehicle uh, to try to do a drama at the memorial. They just don't sell to the mass. You will get a good following, maybe 150, 200 people to come see a drama, but that's a that seats close to 2,000 people. So when you put 150, 200 people in there, it looks pretty sparse. So we thought, well, that's not the. the you can't just do it there. So we need to find the audience. That's when we decided let's take it to the high schools. R invite the high schools in to see a show, something they read and study in their language arts class, their literature classes, and then watch them actually see it come to life on stage the way it was written, as opposed to them reading. Yes, we don't edit any of the, the language or anything like and that. cast it age, race, age appropriately. gender, gender yep. everything is the way it's written. We have had, um, we've had multiple shows where we've done them two or three times, mm -hmm. so over the t last 12 years, uh, but we don't edit anything. We've done it in, four, we've done them in four different venues, it too. Started at um, uh, Hill Theater Kenyon, the very first one, with a uh, Kenyan grad directing us in Mice and Men. Mm -hmm. and then we went to Centerburg, which is oh, state-of-the-art. I love that theater. Uh, and we did three up in there, but uh, the problem we had, uh, Centerburg's closer to Columbus, and some of our further schools are Clear Fork and Fredericktown. They could not get there in time in the morning, and they just wish that we would have it more centrally located. So we were able to bring it, we brought it back to the Memorial Building, and that's where we have been doing. Then during the renovation last year, we did Raisin in the Sun at the Woodward, the newly opened uh, yes, renovated uh, space. Yeah, yep. And that was, that, and that's really cool. I mean, and especially for that kind of show to be done on that kind of stage. Yeah. Um, but we, house, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's history too. Of, well, of, it was a minstrel. Yeah, it was a minstrel, a minstrel show. show. So. Uh, and to have the very first real show, uh, actual play, they had musicians there, which mm -hmm. they've done a wonderful job. But the actual first play is uh, Raisin in the Sun, which is a testament to the plight and the struggle of uh, uh, African American family uh, in the 50s, mm -hmm. housing discrimination, and what a, what a strong show that was, and a wonderful, wonderful cast. Uh, but for it to be uh, for it to be the premier play at the Woodward Opera House. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, other thing is we've not only were you saying that we we don't change the dialogue or anything like that, but we have a talkback with the peep with the kids. And what's even more interesting is that this these shows are sometimes their very first and maybe even only introduction to theater, right? To it's live theater. theater. Right. So yeah, and yeah. you get to see them and they get up there and they ask these kind of questions. I mean, some of the questions are, hey, how'd you learn all those lines yeah, or yeah, all those yeah. things? But then you get other people that just ask these kind of just such poignant questions right. and you don't expect it because you're like, well, these are their high school kids and you don't know what their kind of interest in mice, this mice, topic. Mice and men. One kid asked the uh, actor, Steve Jefferson, uh, in the second version, he played um, um, uh, cro uh, Crooks. Crooks. Yep. Played Crooks. And he asked him, how did you feel when they were using the N-word? The first one did that, too. We had that with, and that was just a college kid yeah. that did that. Yeah. And he was very good, and that was like one well, of his first shows that he'd ever done. And uh, the, uh, Steve appreciated the question. Yeah. He said, you have to understand the time that it was written and people's uh, social mores at the time. And uh, it was, it was, they said it as if it, it was meaningless. Yeah. You know, and uh, it really, these high school kids are kind of like, you know, they cringed when they heard it. And yeah. That, that, that tells you a lot. It tells you yeah. a lot about how far, you know, we have a long way to go, but at least there has been some advance yeah. from the time the play was written. Um, and even doing Dyer Van Frank, I mean, we did a nice right. little montage at the end for the curtain call where we brought each actor out in, in a pool of light. It wasn't a bow. And it wasn't a bow. They just stood there and were featured, and above them was a, a PowerPoint, essentially, picture of the actual 
person. Right. Uh, their name, the de- the year they were born, the year they uh, they passed away, and how. where, where like how. I didn't say how because I didn't yeah. want to go yeah. that far into it, but I did where they passed right. away and their age. You started with the older characters. All the older characters first. And then when you got started to get to the teenagers, people were cr- growing yeah. in. Were cr- it was a little manipulative, but well, I... I it's it's yeah. theater. Yeah. You said we need a we needed a, a curtain call, and I just I couldn't think of anything. It's and I was tech directing that call. show, and yeah. I was like, you can't, we can't have a curtain call. No. You don't. And so I texted you at like two in the morning, saying that I had this PowerPoint thing that I made, and I think it would work if we right. do this. And we tried it out, and it just it, it immediately, even mm-hmm. just us going, well, you know, whatever. Right. I've seen this a hundred times. It's like, wow, that yeah, that hurt. Think, yeah, that was different. Some of our other classic series, which most of the classics, they they're 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 great pieces of literature, but they don't lend themselves for an actors to come out in a line and taking a bow. Uh, uh, I think it was twelve, not twelve Angry Men, but it was um, uh, the Crucible. Mm-hmm. We put them um, in tableaus. In tableaus, yes. And you just brought everybody came out in the dark and they stood with their family units or whatever on different levels of the stage, and we slowly just brought the light up and they were frozen. Mm-hmm. They didn't move or bow. Now, when I directed that for the high school e- eons ago, I did that, that's I, I did it that way, and that's what gave me the idea of you know you don't have to come out and applaud and smile mm-hmm. and clap because it's not that kind of a feeling. Yeah. Um, we did that with uh, another one. Um, uh, I think it was Death of a Salesman. I don't think we came out. I think out. you guys were in your areas. So right. you were in the center and right. then it was in the bedroom right. and all the other kind of random people were scattered downstage and I had and the, lights the kids, yeah. the, the brothers, up in their bedroom right. of the house. Right. So I think we did that with 12 Younger Men. We just kind of brought you out in order. In order, one, and two, you know, like and have a name. yeah, and you had the the um, uh, not the bailiff, but the him bring right, you right. down like you just were entering the stage, and you just all came down and just took one little bow, and that bow. was it. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't any kind of you yeah. know big thing. Right. And so the classics, the classics came out in 2008, right. and then from there you had another idea to do a senior series from that. And we used the Alco venue because it was smaller and instead of using dinner because some of these shows were pretty um, poignant, we did um, uh, the very first one I Never Sang for My Father uh, featuring our dear friend, uh, the late Chuck Ransom. Mm-hmm. And then we did um, uh, Trip the Bountiful, Driving Miss Daisy. Driving Miss Daisy. And it's yeah. all black box, essentially. I mean, yeah. there's it's a representational staging because it does take place in uh, different areas. You've got a variety of scenes and sets, so you have set pieces representing, and you bring up area lighting. And we usually did dessert or hors d'oeuvres. Some sort of thing, yes. Right, right. So, you know, so you did get to munch or eat or, you know, dine on dessert, but it wasn't a full meal. And we usually had it, you know, starting at 8 o'clock. Mm-hmm. So it was after the dinner. And, and people would eat downstairs and they'd come up. But it wasn't the senior uh, uh, shows. They were never that. But they were issues that dealt with senior citizens. Senior citizens. People over the age of retirement and, and uh, the plight of what their middle-aged children are going through or what they're going through. So they're strong themes, but it was theater. Yes. You know, so it's making theater. So we had to find a way that it just wasn't dinner theater and it wasn't a musical, but our artists need an, another uh, venue. And there's so many wonderful works of art out there. And, there. and we have a community that wants to see those. Now, it's not a strong community. I mean, we don't have people breaking down the doors no. to see dramas. No, but, but there's, there's an following. interest. There is an interest. Yeah. And with, with shows like that, it, you know, it wasn't a lot of times you see senior theater as they call it and they're just reading a script they do they do readings right right, right. and they don't want to it's almost like they don't want to challenge right. the older actors oh. to do something and, and I've seen that and I'm like that uh, that's not interesting to me and that it seems like you're just it's not fair to the these older actors who you're like man they are great this person is fantastic why aren't they performing it for real where I can right. just feel this gut reaction so from sitting them. on a stool flipping through a flipping page. through pages it's not reading. as genuine yeah. for them yeah. uh, so it was amazing seeing Chuck and, and Mickey uh, do these kind of shows um, Driving Miss Daisy and Trip to Bountiful mm-hmm. uh, I mean Chuck was just a powerhouse oh, in that yeah, in that show wonderful, wonderful. Um, and because he he left the stage 
not a lot, really. I mean, no, it, it was you were a narrator and came on and off and did things, but was he sun, was yeah. just there. Yeah. Um, and that's a lot. That is, and that may be another reason why they're just like we don't want to put that much pressure on them. But we took it to competition, and it won a lot of awards. Yeah, awesome. they. I think they People just appreciated it. it. It's the same thing with a child actor. You know, it's like they don't want to put as much pressure on them because they may not think that they can handle it. And it's like I don't think that's fair to the actor right. to say well, you don't think I can do it. I think I can. Yeah, well, it's challenge me. It's enjoy this as opposed to a sport. Yeah. You, you, a sport, you have a limited uh, window. Yeah. There's just a window of where you can actually be active, and then a lot of lot of uh, athletes or whatever, you go into broadcasting or coaching yeah. or something. Our, our, as actors, we, we can go right up to the end. Yeah, ours is just age appropriateness. Yeah. We're, we're just yeah, like, right. I can't exactly. play 19 anymore. That's uh, all right. right. I'll play the right. dad. Yeah. Uh, and so then even from the senior theater now, you created a, well, I guess this is for uh, MTV Arts, you, now we have an Arts IQ program for youth, yeah. which we now innovation also bring and quality kids. quality is what the IQ stands for, innovation and quality, innovative theater and quality, and that's uh, another one of uh, the acronyms that Janice came up with. She's pretty good with those. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they stick, and they, they're very appropriate. Now, was the first technically, I guess, Arts IQ, not Arts IQ, where it was the unofficial Arts IQ, would you say that was the pirate show? Because of the, not that the fact that the kids weren't in it and they weren't doing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being the performers like they had adapted into, but where all the kids were doing the behind the scenes stuff that they had been wanting to try. So it was like a little sub that pre the, the, uh, beginning. How I became a pirate was an interesting um, uh, gathering of of different arts. We had somebody making a documentary during this. We had the playwright and the and the people that wrote the music and lyrics. They came down. They were involved in parts of it, or they came up actually mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, we had the publishing company. Uh, one of their um, one of their uh, vice presidents come in. Uh, we had uh, who was it? Uh, the state representative come and gave a key to our uh, our kid director, mm -hmm. JJ House. But you think but about the that. Is all, the kids all took on a part of the production team, and they were mentored by adults. Yes. Yeah. So to think, and you can say that. Well, like, oh wow, look at how we created this thing for that we did where we had a bunch of different things and he said well what if now instead of that we're showcasing the kids by putting them in the show by making it a show for them for kids as the actors and the audience that um, yeah Arts IQ uh, it actually came a year or two after that I believe uh, 2014 I think because that was uh, that was Little Mermaid right um, th that came about during Shrek uh, when we auditioned for Shrek, I didn't want to put a lot of children in it. I only put the children that uh, I, we came to a point with our musicals where we're just not going to shove a bunch of kids on stage. And a lot of community theaters, they do that, and they need to because mm -hmm. they need to get people in their seats. And we have limited space to begin with. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but there, there aren't any real legitimate roles for kids when you pad the cast. I mean, Annie, even when I directed Annie, I kept it down. Uh, the second time, well, well, the first time, we kept it down to uh, we didn't use every child. No, condition. you had a couple of urchin kids like uh, that were their newsboys news and things, boys, especially because of the boys who didn't yeah. have anything to do. Yeah, for scene changes and yeah. things like that. But um, with Shrek, I only used the, the two Fionas and little Shrek at the very beginning, and that was it. And the rest were either uh, college age, high school, or adult actors. And we kept it to that. And then I thought, well, let's give these kids something else. So then we decided to do Little Mermaid Jr. And we put kids on Heelys, and they took a week-long workshop, and then they all, everybody in the workshop, you paid to take the workshop because you were taught by uh, the people that uh, knew their craft, and uh, the kids got lessons, and they um, learned how to uh, do different things in theater and the technology, and then at the end of that week, they auditioned for roles in that, and every child that was in the workshop, were ca they, we cast them in the show. And then our audience, again, who's your audience? We brought in elementary kids. We brought in kindergarten, first, and second, uh, all over the county. And we packed it for two shows. And the idea for that, it was twofold, to give our performers a chance to actually do a show, a live show with microphones and costuming and the lights in their eyes and know this is, this is places, this is what this means, this is how you do what you need to do. But the kids sitting in the audience learn so much. They learn how to sit still again. They learn how to listen, how to clap appropriately and when to laugh.
laugh. We have never, with our arts IQ at the high school or the elementary, we've never had a rude audience. Yeah. Never. And sometimes those kids, again, might not be able to, because, I mean, yes, we are very, very, very much reasonably priced. But even then, there's some people that just, it's very difficult for people sometimes to even just get it one ticket. Right. You know, and these kids that are coming, it, again, could be their only experience in seeing live theater. Sure, begin. And, yeah. and then that could get someone to go, ooh, I'm really excited. I want to see this later. I mean, I, I had never known that Andrew Ruckman said, he was like, I saw you when I was a little kid do LeFou the first time. And that made me kind of want to do stuff. And right. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Because, you know, Fire. yeah. And I mean, the kid is amazing to watch. And he's so, so talented. And to see that, you know, it, it was from just watching live theater. Right. Uh, and his first opportunity to see live theater. You never know where inspiration comes from. You, does, you just don't know who's watching or who's listening. Yeah. I can honestly say I was not uh, influenced by seeing you as Pappy in, <laughs> in, uh, in Little Abner. Little Abner. Uh, I, I think I was all about <laughs> 29 years old when they put me in a bald wig and a little gray goatee and yeah, running around. In 89 or 90, I think, yeah, is when was, that was. Yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, I had fun with that show. I had fun with the people I worked with. Uh, I love the cast. Uh, looking back on it now, I, I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't one of my <laughs> glorious moments, but I did have a lot of fun doing So... Um, and actually, I was thinking about this with the kid shows. You did two or three of them at the Alcove. Mm -hmm. You did Fiddler and... Junior. Uh, Fiddler Junior and uh, Jungle Book Kids, Kids or Jungle Book Junior? Uh, I think Jungle it was Book uh, Kids. Kids. Okay, and you've also done Jungle Book Junior and Kids out at the Gallagher Center. Right. So we've been able to do those in right. different venues, too, before we kind of found a permanent right. venue for it. They start out, they're always workshops. The kids' shows always start out as workshops, and they need to because you got to find out where they are. Now, we're at the point now with our junior shows. We've divided into junior and kids now because we just have so many kids, uh, and they have their own shows. So grades, if you're going into third grade that summer, you know, the following fall, up to sixth grade, you are considered the kids' show, which is a shorter version. And then you're in the junior show if you're seventh grade through twelfth grade. And uh, they're, a little, they're a longer show, and it's a little more demanding. Well, with our junior shows, we um, we just, they don't have to sit there and learn all the uh, the beginning technical things and the vocabulary for theater. Uh, we go right into learning the music, some of the choreography. They get a three-day three day workshop, and they audition. Whereas the younger kids get a four-day, and on the fifth day, they audition for the kids' version of the show. And so that's where we've deviated in the last uh, two years, just knowing that we have to find um, uh, a new way of doing this because of the interest. Yeah. The opportunities for the for mm -hmm. people. Um, so uh, we've also done other little venue things, uh, like a we did a uh, uh, awesome eighties prom. We did oh, Tony and nice. Joe, yeah. not Tony and T Tina's Joey and Maria's. Joey and Maria's wedding. It's the other one. Yeah. They don't. Yeah. The ones they'll give you the right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, we've even brought musicals now to the alcove. So right. it's amazing that we can still kind of get different opportunities in different all places. around yeah. in different spaces mm -hmm. that we never thought we could. Yeah. We did interactives for a while. It yeah. was a lot of fun. Uh, I think we've kind of moved past that a little bit. I mean, we may do another one again sometime later. As you find an audience for it that right kind there. of is interested, or it's just like, oh, it's the time to bring it back. Right. You know, where everyone wants to be like, yeah, let's let's see that again. Uh, they can be just as much work as um, as regular uh, productions and shows, but uh, we uh, we um, have uh, adapted a, uh, a mantra, making theater. So whatever we do has to be involved with making theater. Theater. It can't be a sidebar to something else. Uh, you know, dress up in costumes and do a birthday party. Uh, let's be mannequins for uh, some sort of display somewhere. Yes. Be, you know, those types of things. I, th there's an audience for that. There's an audience, and it's legit, but it's just not where we want to take the energy of our, pr our production team and to throw all that energy so that when we do have a, uh, a theater production, they They've done this, this, and this, and they're too exhausted, or they don't have the time to actually put the invest the time into putting on a, a, a big music.
musical or a big okay. drama because they're too busy doing being picked at, you know, and, and things that aren't truly making theater. And we do enough already now. We've got not only are we doing MTV art shows, but in between or sometimes concurrently with MTV arts, we're doing alcove shows. Right. There's four shows. So here, yeah, we're just we're it's here. it's amazing. It's its own season. We're starting season tickets. Right. Uh, and, and that's another new adaptation that we've right. kind of grown into. MTV arts kind of shuts down uh, from uh, the kids show in the end of September and then gears back up with rehearsals in February. Yes, unless now we end uh, yeah, and them trying show. doing a Christmas show. So yeah. even then, that's another evolution. Right. Um, what would you say, honestly, it, you are most proud of when it comes to uh, MTV Arts and the alcove? Like, just from the very beginning or going but looking back and everything? Um, I, I just think everything has fallen in sort of serendipity. I mean, one thing begets another and another, and I think it's the positive energy, and it's the people that uh, you surround yourself with, and everybody having the same goal, quality, quality. Uh, there's really no place for ego in it, and, and you know, that's, it, you know, you could say that, and there's a lot of things you're proud of, and, that, and ego is a proud, is a part of that. Uh, being proud is part of your ego, but um, it's just everybody just wants the best, and you step aside when somebody has a better idea, or somebody comes up with something that is even better than what you thought, and you've got to allow that that collaboration, and that's that's what I'm I, I'm most proud of, is the the feel of collaboration, uh, knowing when to step back and let somebody lead, and the passion, and the passion. The passion. Yeah, you have to know that as as somebody that is at the top. I mean, somebody's got to take the brunt, and, and somebody the bucks has to stop somewhere. <laughs> but you know, someone has to take take the uh, take you know the phone call from the mom whose kid didn't get cast in the role they thought. And you, you got to talk these people down. Um, you got to you, you listen to them and, and validate their feelings, and then allow, allow them to know that there's going to be other opportunities. And, and you got to do that with uh, with um, a kindness. You got because everybody you, you put yourself out there as an actor, as an artist, not just an acting, but any artist, because you're making something to share, and the minute somebody tells you they don't like what you did, or they're ridiculing what you did, I mean, that hurts, because you're, you're bearing your, your soul to them. So, the passion that we brought, and, and the goal of quality, of people coming in, and we've had people come in, and they stay for a while, and then their life moves on, which is great, and then they come back, or maybe they're still a strong supporter, but they can't give us the time that they used to, mm -hmm. but the time that they gave us, we're so thankful for to help build this, and uh, there's always someone else coming in, and it may not be the same the same um, um, uh, range that the other person had, but whatever they're giving us is something that we value, and that that's what I'm most proud of: the collaboration and the quality. Awesome. So what I want to do a little bit with you is more technique and questions about you and certain things that you know have influenced you show-wise and things like that. So and that'll be just like a shorter kind of episode thing. Oh, good. Um, so. All right, and that is the end of part two of our very first brand new podcast, taking us back into the history and past of MTV Arts and where it's come to today and where it's going to be heading after all of this is over. Next week, we're going to pick up with the part three of this podcast, in which I interview Bruce Jacqueline again. And we continue our talk, and we get a little bit more about him, what he's been up to, some of his favorite shows and things like that, some of the most things he's proud of. Uh, just a little bit more casual of a talk between the two of us. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next one.